Sup, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Side Hustler Society podcast. I'm real excited about this episode because a lot of y'all may uh, know that I have uh, some uh, properties or some apartment units on Airbnb that actually make a pretty uh, decent cash flow. They tend to cash flow between uh, 600 to $1,000 per month. But I've been uh, on Airbnb for about like nine months. And I always uh, tell people that if it doesn't matter how quick of a learner you are or what the situation is, if you've done something less than a year, you're technically a prospect. So there's certain things that you're not going to really be able to talk about or touch because you just don't have the experience. There's nothing wrong with that. That's why I'm glad to be bringing on an actual expert who's been in the short-term rental space. Well, not just short-term rentals, but rentals in general for a good while and has a lot of game to offer y'all. His name is Micah Artis, and he actually has a uh, company that he founded called ShareBnB, which we'll get into in the uh, interview. But he has a lot of experience finding properties, acquiring properties, putting them on Airbnb, VRBO, the do's, the don'ts, the expectations as far as how much you can make and more. So I'm really excited to bring this uh, good game to y'all. We're going to go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and hit that intro. Welcome to the Side Hustler Society podcast with your host, Elijah Bilal. This is where you can find out more about hustles that are best for you. And of course, make more money in the process. Elijah has been in the gig economy and freelance space for over five years and has done over 3,000 deliveries on Uber Eats. He's an Airbnb super host, runs multiple YouTube channels, and is the author of the best-selling book, The Anatomy of Financial Success. It's his mission to empower people with the tools needed to be successful. Now, welcome your host, the king of side hustles, Elijah Bilal. Micah Artis is a real estate investor, short-term rental investor, and most importantly, a family man. Micah bought his first property right after the 2008 recession using the Kitty condo program and has since bought four more rentals that he uses as short-term rentals. Micah and his wife are also the founders of ShareBnB, which offers over 400-plus rentals on Airbnb. Micah also hosts the second-longest-running short-term rental podcast, Live, Let, Thrive. So with that intro being done, Micah, how are you doing today? I'm good. Yourself? So far, so good. Just happy to really talk about this uh, Airbnb game because uh, I really do like to be honest with people. And uh, mm -hmm. I've been in the game for about like nine months. And I always mm -hmm. say like your first year, I don't care how fast you learn, uh, you're a prospect. And a prospect is limited on what they can teach and what they can say. That's why I'm yeah. excited about bringing on an expert that's been in the game for a good while. Okay, yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, let me know what you got. Yeah, it's a um, it's a journey, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a journey. So it's just a matter of uh, being consistent with it. Whatever you're consistent at is going to show show its light, you know, someday, you know. But uh, it's about being consistent with it, learning the changes, um, and just being, being a good host, you know, uh, really focusing in on that hospitality aspect. But let me know what you got. And I, got, I, I can tell you my whole journey and tell you the hiccups I've had, the good, the bad, the ugly. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that sounds like a plan. So just for the audience that uh, may not be uh, familiar with you and your work, how about you just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what, what got you interested in the uh, rental game per se? Um, the rental game, be honest with you, I've been in the, well, my dad and my parents have actually been in the rental game since I was a little kid. Um, what really got me like into it is like kind of them exposing me to it a little bit. Like I never knew what I, we were doing, but that's what they were doing. So basically when I was like six years old, my brother's six years old to me, he's 12, uh, he was 12, I was six. We'd always go to my dad's rental properties in Portland, Oregon, and we'd be cutting the grass. You know, we always thought, man, why are we cutting these other people grass? They can't cut the grass themselves. So <laughs> we, at, at the time, we, I didn't really know, you know, this was his duplex. He owned it, you know, and um, he'd go, we, he'd take us with us to collect rent. And then we'd cut the grass, pick up cans sitting around. And what we do is after we we take the cans over to the uh, Portland's real big on recycling. We go recycle the cans and we get to keep that money. Um, so that's basically how I got, I knew what real estate was, right? So by the time I was 19, 
um, I, I had moved to Arkansas. I moved back to Little Rock where my parents are and family is originally from. And, uh, you know, kind of just what didn't really have a home. I was sleeping on my uncle's couch, sleeping on my aunt's couch, my sister's couch, you know, kind of just bouncing around. And I was yeah, in college. Nomad lifestyle. Yeah, there you go. Real life nomad. Car, I had a Chevy and that was it, you know. So I was just bounce, bouncing around. And um, we found this thing called the Kitty Condo Program where we could actually, you could buy a house with three and a half percent down. And after you buy the house next year, because remember the market was crashed, nobody was really buying anything and everything was sitting. Mm -hmm. So after the market crashed, uh, the government gave out these incentives to buy houses. So they needed to pick the market back up. So we had this kitty condo program. So basically you put down three and a half percent on a house. And after the first year of you living there, you have to live there for a year. You live there and you have to be a college student. They'll give you your down payment back after on your tax return the next year. So that's how we basically, yeah, we basically got a free house. So that was the first rental of property that, well, it wasn't even a rental property. I owned it. I lived in it. I lived in it all throughout college. And I lived in that house until August 23rd, 2013, until I moved to Texas. And when I moved to Texas, um, 2015, I got married. And after that, me and my wife bought our home that I'm currently sitting in. And then we bought a condo. And since then, we've 1031 that condo into another property. And then we closed on a property last year. With, no, two years ago, we did our first burr. And then right now, we, uh, we're we actually working on, we're doing another burr, but that burr might turn into a flip because it's taking so long. The rehab's going over over budget. But uh, that's basically my whole journey in the shell. And then right now, I'm looking to pick up more. Mm. So I'm going to ask the question that everyone in the audience is probably wondering. How did mm -hmm. you adapt to the Texas heat? Because everyone has that on their mind right now. Oh, the Texas well, heat. Well, did you even adapt? Maybe you didn't. <laughs> nah, man. Uh, I ain't going to lie. If I moved from Portland or Portland, Oregon to here, it would have been a whole other problem. But, like, I went from <laughs> Portland to Arkansas, so I was in that country heat. You know what I'm saying? And then I came to Texas, and that was heat, too. But, you know, I, I, I kind of got used to it in Arkansas a little bit. So, yeah, man. I, I, if I would have moved from Portland to here, I would have been – I would have passed out, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, y'all, Arkansas played a role in being that transition state to get you here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so, would you say that uh, seeing your family's business kind of played a role in you being motivated to be a real estate investor uh, in the future? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, you, I look back at it and, you know, what I, what I wanted to do was, as humans, right, especially in America, what we have to do is we have to see the things that our parents did and we have to amplify them. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to amplify it 10 X what they were doing. They had properties here and there, but they never uh, went all in like me and my wife are doing. And so that's one thing my dad's, my, my dad's always had to be about. He's like, man, I'm happy y'all both on the same page and y'all want to grow it. Right. So that does have a huge role. And then just also having a why, right. So uh, growing right. up, I grew up in the Northwest. Right. Uh, and my, the, we got lucky because we weren't from there. My parents are from Arkansas, Poor, not I ain't gonna say poor, but like country town. You know what I mean? They're from uh, right. Little Rock, Arkansas, Mariana, Arkansas. My dad's from the. They still got dirt roads. So when we moved up to the Northwest, we didn't really have family. So just so happens where we moved to in the Northwest, the people across the street were from Arkansas and Louisiana, and they took me in, me and my brothers and sisters in. They raised us like we were their own, and we all just they kind of made that place a home for us. So. I remember they used to tell us stories about things that happened to them while they were living down south, and they were way older than my they were like 20 30 years older than my parents so they had a lot more game than my parents about things that were going on and places mm -hmm. that they couldn't live because of the color of their skin and so when i was six it never really occurred to me and clicked to me that like you know they were really talking about redlining and things of that nature so i always knew so by the time i got older i really knew like yo i want to be able to control real estate and be so not only to control it provide uh housing for families and also mm -hmm. be able to pass on generational wealth to my kids Mm. So yeah. that, that's three things. You're providing some that people need. Mm -hmm. You're providing generational wealth for your for your children, for your family. And mm -hmm. of course, uh, you're helping yourself in the process. Like, who's going to get mad at that? <laughs> got to, for <laughs> sure, man. Yeah, you got to. That purpose is huge, man. That purpose that that purpose and that why is going to bring bring forward that self-motivation. I know me and you talked about that yesterday. So it is yeah. huge. Yeah, definitely. So I know a lot of people when it comes to this rental game, Mm -hmm. they're asking this question because they want to hop in, but there's a lot of ambiguity about it. So like when you're 
looking to like acquire a property to get a rent on Airbnb or VRBO or maybe even do direct bookings like you've talked about uh, before? Like what's your overall process? How do you approach that? Um, it depends on how I'm looking at it. So because, like, you know, I do two methods, right? I do rental arbitrage and then I own properties. So on the rental arbitrage side, I'm looking at um, rental arbitrage. I'm, gonna lie, I'm looking at 100 percent location, right? Mm -hmm. uh, location, 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 because I'm, I, I cater to like in Dallas, for example, I cater to business travelers. Where's everyone moving to in the Dallas area? Far north Dallas. That's me too. Moving up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're moving up to the north <laughs> Dallas area, Plano, Frisco, uh, all in that area. That's where like people from out of town with the money, they're buying, building houses, but they need somewhere to stay in between. So therefore, when I target areas, I'm targeting north Dallas, Plano, and I need to make sure that they have the amenities for them. So, for example, I'm targeting business travelers. I'm make, making sure they have high speed Internet, a pool if they're traveling with families. Uh, make sure I'm, they have a, like a dog park at the apartment complex that I'm working with. So arbitrage is location, location, location. So I have more and I have five in Dallas and I have five more in Houston and they're right by the medical center. Now Houston's a little saturated. So yeah, be careful right. with Houston, <laughs> very saturated. But a couple of years back when it wasn't, it was a great location because it was in the med center. And the reason why it's Houston saturated, of course, is because there's no regulations. Now when I'm owning, it's a little bit different process because I do, I use the birth strategy, right? So I need to first make sure it's a good deal. After I make sure it's a good deal, I need to make sure that I have a target avatar that's coming to that area. So in like Little Rock, where I do a lot of my burrs, I make sure that I could build the space out to cater to construction workers. Because what happened was in Arkansas, and this I learned this three, four years ago when I was hopped into that market. I learned that Arkansas outsources all their construction work to other states. So the people who live there don't, the people who do the construction work there don't even live there, right? So they're right. coming from Texas. Uh, Iowa, you know, these small towns. And what they do is they'll work for like eight months, then go back home for four months and not work for the rest of the year because they're getting paid so much. So I then catered my places to those people. And then in the off season, I make sure I can cater it to traveling nurses and then more business professionals. So I offer things like, and then what I do to attract those business professionals with families, what I do is I put things like Tesla chargers in there because I know for a fact the Tesla charger is going to attract the 54-year-old male with kids, grandkids, they're traveling. So it's just about a matter of knowing your target avatar. That's also something that's not going to be easily duplicated. Like, oh, I added mm -hmm. this as an enemy, but like the cat across the street can add it too. Like a Tesla charger. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see a lot of people doing that anytime soon. Yeah. It, 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 it's a few, like, we really got into it last year off of a podcast we did with our guy Clint. And he was like really going into like, man, he, he was like, man, I got to really dive into what this city doesn't have and then dive into that and then I'll provide that to the people coming. And that was a huge thing. And that lights went off in my head. I was like, Oh, I got to find that. And that's how I came up with the Tesla charger. Yeah. I think I remember listening to that episode and uh, for everyone that's uh, wondering, we'll leave a link in the uh, show notes to, uh, to his podcast, live, let thrive, but there's a lot of uh, awesome content over there. So you used a few words that obviously uh, you and me are familiar with, but the audience may not know what that is, like rental arbitrage and like uh, target avatar. Could you like uh, break those down a little for those that don't know? Okay. So rental arbitrage is basically, I don't own the property. I rent it from a traditional landlord. He rent it to my business for a year, two years, two years, preferably. And then I take the property, put it on Airbnb, Verbo, and then my own direct booking site and like CHIPA, which is corporate housing providers of America, you know, the, all the OTAs. And then mm -hmm. I make the prop, whatever, I pay the landlord his rent. I pay lights, water, gas. I pay the landlord his rent. Anything I make above that is mine to keep. So, for example, when I look at a property, I want it to make me a thousand dollars more in cash flow net. So, if it doesn't do that, then I'm probably going to be cutting that property. And that's what we're doing in Houston. And that property is not worth my time. And then you said something else target avatar. Target, yeah. uh, target avatar is who you serve, right? So, if you are. If you know you're near a hospital, you, let's say you pick up a two bed, one bath, a two bed, one bath house, like in Arkansas, you get a house like that near the hospital. You can cater that to tar traveling nurses because they're coming in and out. Uh, the cost on those houses are usually cheaper and usually nurses are looking for a cheaper accommodation. So it's just a matter of who you serve. That's your target avatar. Who do you want to cater to and book your place? Cool, cool. And uh, in my experience, and you can tell me if you uh, have this too. 
not only is it important to have a target avatar, it's also important to have a example of someone you don't want in there as far as the type of traveler. Because <laughs> like uh, that kind of plays a role in the strategy you use. Because me, I don't tend to want one or two nice days because people, the higher risk of some party jumping off is just higher with those conditions. So I set mm -hmm. my pricing so that if someone wants to book it, they're going to be coming out of the pocket. But if they book like four days and over, that's when the, the discounts start kicking in and it attracts the type of person I want in there. So I think it, it plays a big role in you knowing who you don't want in there too. Would you say that? For sure. Um, what I do, I do the same thing. Like if you're going to stay, I do a two night minimum on everything. So if you do, if you do stay two nights, you are going to pay a huge premium because you ain't going to get no discount. So I set, I actually set my place up uh, to where, you know, anything 30 days out is a minimum of four nights. But if you stay seven nights, you get a discount. If you stay 28 nights, you get a another long stay discount. So you get a 10% mm -hmm. for seven, a 20% for 28. So the people who are looking to book farther out, they ain't going to stay the four nights. It's inflated, right? They're like, I ain't going to stay no minimum of four nights. It's inflated. But the people who are looking to stay a week to two weeks, they're like, oh, I'll book this place. It looks like I'm getting a huge discount, you know, or if right. you're staying a month, they get a huge discount. And then what that does, that actually cuts back on a lot of resources, too. So you're actually getting like uh, you're not having to do as many turnovers. You're not having to go through yeah. as much uh, supplies and things of that nature. So, yeah, uh, I love midterm to cor midterm corporate long term stays. I love those all day. Yeah, because your operational expenses are just way lower because your housekeepers don't need to come in and clean the place as much. Like mm -hmm. if you're doing like these three night nice stays a bunch per month versus like you got like two or three weeks people staying at a time. Yeah. And, and, and another thing, and, and this is another tip that I, I've been starting to implement as well. If you're doing those like midterm, long term stays every three months, what I would do is every quarter hire like a professional cleaning service to do a deep clean, because a lot of times they don't report stuff to you like they don't report like stuff that's going on and then the cleaner they'll report certain things which is a good thing you, you got to work on your communication with your cleaners but mm -hmm. if you get like molly made to go over there every quarter and you know, they'll they'll make your place spotless like spotless they'll get it down clean wiped out clean so and then you just let them know hey it's a move-in clean so they'll get everything set up for you hmm. i'm gonna have to follow that advice because i do have someone staying in one of my apartments and uh he's staying working on his bachelor's i mean as an mba Mm -hmm. for the summer and he's uh gonna be he's gonna be getting out in mid-august but he's been there for a little over like three months so oh, that would yeah. be like the perfect situation to do that and what you can do is what you do is go ahead and block your calendar now call molly mate let your regular cleaner do her regular clean and then mm -hmm. let the molly made crew come in the next day and go clean it do the deep clean because they're gonna get baseboards they're gonna get everything the cabinets they're gonna wipe everything down clean up your uh your vents, all that dust, they ceiling fans. And, you know, you can get your regular cleaner to do that if that's what they do. But Molly made and like other little like professional cleaning services, man, they, they, they tackle it. Okay, cool. So yeah. when it comes to, and this is a natural lead into this question, but when it comes to rental arbitrage versus like owning, like in your opinion, uh, which one is better? I know that might be subjective, but like for you, which one do you feel is better? Owning all day, man. This is how I, I mean, that doing that asset, right? like when, and, and, and I'm going to go deep in this. Like people, when I hear people arguing that it's like that, that's the craziest thing to argue. That's like, would you rather sign to a record label or have your own? Who would say, man, I want to sign to somebody. Like, I'm serious. I'd be like, what, well, where does the commonality in that even, you know, but no, nah, honestly, man, it's owning because one, if you know how to own owning's cheaper, arbitraging is faster. That's the reason why I like arbitrage. I like arbitrage because it's faster and you can scale it. You can scale owning, but it ain't going to be as fast as arbitrage. I can't just walk up to somebody. Hey, I need 10 apartments. I got people coming to town. I need 10 apartments. I need to set them up. It's going to be hard to do that with owning. But the thing that I love about owning, if you, you, I use the birth strategy, which stands, and let me explain that. That means buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. So basically I go buy dilapidated properties put work into them, rent it out, refinance all my money that I put into it back out. So I'm getting the property for free. 
And what I actually do is I actually put the furniture costs into the rehab budget. So now I can furnish the property, then refinance everything back out. So I got a free house, free, free furniture. And after I get that, now I put it up and it's an infinite return and I'm getting equity and it's appreciated. So now I can pass this on to my kids. I can do whatever I want with it. You know, that's my benefit of owning. Now, arbitraging, like I said before, is scalable. So you can go get, get them up really, really quick. But the problem is there's no equity. There's nothing you can pass on. It's a lease. But this is what I tell people to do if they do arbitrage. I will suggest have a few apartments, right? That's just to get your cash flow up. But mm -hmm. have some places that you are actually talking to a direct landlord because what that does is you're building a relationship. I say relationship over money all day because what you do is you build that relationship up. And if they want to sell in the future, you know everything that's wrong with the property. You've been there for a year, two years, whatever. You might be able to get a discount on it or you can just be like, look, man, if you ever want to sell it, talk talk to me. We, we, we're actually buying properties. You might even give you a discount on the property because they know you. So it's about building relationships. That's one thing that people don't do in the arbitrage business. They're just looking for that monthly cash flow. I'm like, man, you just need to be building relationships with these owners. You can buy their properties at some point. So uh, owning all day, though, man, I, I and, and owning it goes with um, owning versus arbitrage is also an age thing. Right. Uh, I'm 33 years old. I have kids. I have a family. So it's, I can't just be sitting here waiting on, you know, a page, a check, a check, a check. I need a check and I need that thing to go up in price without me doing nothing to it. So right. it's just about a mindset and a goal. But I do tell people, if you're in your 20s, you ain't married, you don't have no kids. Go arbitrage everything if you want. But just make sure and keep in the back of your mind that ownership the end of it is the goal. You know what? That's an interesting uh, dynamic because I feel like we're kind of opposites in that regard. Not what mm -hmm. you said, but it's you said you're married and you have kids, so your overall goal is going to be different. Ownership holds more value. Mm -hmm. Versus me, um, I'm three years younger than you, and I'm um, I'm single, mm -hmm. so like I actually do value the arbitrage game, but I really mm -hmm. do respect the ownership game too. Mm -hmm. But I'm taking the cash and investing it in something else, so it still has a long term uh, plan. You know, I think this strategy is a little undervalued, but if you're going to arbitrage. I still can't get around the fact that you're not building an asset by arbitraging. So now, this isn't financial advice, entertainment purposes only, but I have a four fund portfolio in the stock market that I just take 10% of the money that I um, get from arbitraging every single month. And it goes into the stock market. Mm. At least I'm building something up in the asset column. Cause I can't get around the fact that, Hey, it's just straight up cash. If you know the history of cash, cash is a currency and currency nowadays, it's meant to acquire assets. The currency itself is depreciating in value. Facts. Facts. You got to park your money somewhere. I, you know what I'm saying? Now I'm not mad at it. If you park your money in stocks, do it. If you park your money somewhere, park it in real estate, stocks, I don't care. But if you're just doing it for cash just to go and do this and that, nah, you got to park it somewhere, man. I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all with you, Elijah. <laughs> right, right. So speaking of money, my audience would assassinate me if we didn't get into the Benjamins. So mm -hmm. like, I, I can tell you've had experience doing this part time and like full time. Mm -hmm. like if a person wanted to hop in the game on a part time basis, how much would they expect to uh, make if they were, I guess, for like 10 to 20 hours a week if they're doing Airbnb or VRB or whatever it may be? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the income you think they could expect to make? Um, if you're if you're doing it part time, you can make six figures doing it part time a year if you really wanted to. I mean, you, all you need really is. Probably to get six figures, you probably need eight to 10 units to get six figures, probably less, depending on what kind of units you get. Uh, if you're in the arbitrage game and you just want high cash flow units, get a house. Get If you have five houses, honestly, on short term rentals in a decent area, you could easily retire, quit your job with five houses. No joke. Like You could easily be making six figures and replace your income. Uh, if you listen to uh, my podcast with Rachel Gainsborough, she had 10 and she was doing each one was doing, a, I think each one was doing six figures, each property. So mm -hmm. if you're if you're in the right area, you at the right property, it, it just depends. And you in that 20 hours a week, you could be working full time, a full time job and managing that because you could have everything set up in Slack where you're the supervisor, where people just come to you if they need something, how hire a team of VAs. You could easily be making six figures. Seven figures in that case. <laughs> yeah, I've seen the like those of y'all that don't believe us, like just actually Google it. You're gonna yeah. see people posting their Airbnb and VRB or like screenshots of their earnings. Mm -hmm. It's pretty doable. Oh yeah. 
easily, you know, and, and it's it's just it's so many ways to do it. You can do arbitrage, you can own, you can co-host, you know, you a lot of people sleep on co-hosting, but a lot of people making money co-hosting and then there's no risk to you with co-hosting. And that's another thing about the arbitrage, too, is the risk does fall on you. Right. And then right, the, right. if the risk falls on you, there's no equity backing it. That's my only that's another issue with arbitrage. So if something happens like when a property that I own, shit hits the fan. Uh, I'm like, my bad. I don't know if we cuss on here, but stuff no, is fine. <laughs> okay. Stuff hits the fan, you know, and when it hits the fan, it's like, okay, I have my equity. I can sell it. I can, you know, refi, I can get some cash out of it and go somewhere else. But that's another thing. And it's just about risk tolerance, man. Just being risk tolerance. Right. And uh, I was going to ask the full-time potential, but like, I, I think people can use their imagination at this point. If you can make that much part-time, use your imagination if you do this full-time, right? Man. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. If you can do it full-time, you go all in on it, man, you at least be making a set. You have a seven-figure salary. I mean, a seven-figure business. Yeah, because this is the Side Hustlers Society podcast, but some people do want to remove the word side from side hustle and just, like, mm-hmm. be a hustler. So yeah. th- just uh, keep that in mind, audience. But we're going to go ahead and take a quick commercial break. Y'all don't go anywhere. Let's uh, hit y'all with this real quick. Is your fear of personal finance holding you back from going after what you want? What if I told you there was a way to get rid of your insecurities? Every person has their own way of making money, budgeting style, and a way of spending money. The key to financial success is the ability to use the right styles for you that ensure success. So, rather than making you focus on avoiding your emotions, this book focuses on empowering them and using them to achieve what you want. Learn how to build and increase the income streams you desire. Understand how to budget your money in a way that you are always moving forward financially. Know how to remove stress from spending money by knowing what works best for your personality. Learn methods to effectively evaluate a financial opportunity within minutes to see if it's right for you. The Anatomy of Financial Success, the key to building financial confidence and destroying financial insecurity by Elijah Below. Buy now, available on paperback and ebook. Sup, everyone, and welcome back to this episode of the Side Hustler Society podcast. Just gave a shout out to my book, The Anatomy of Financial Success. It's also available on audiobook form, too. So if you're interested, go to www.financialanatomybook.com. You can get that good game in that book. It'll also be linked in the description and pinned comment if you're on YouTube. So hopping back to this, uh, I'll say, uh, rental game. A lot of people, they, what advice would you give to someone who has decided, okay, I'm going to uh, enter the market, I'm going to start. I want to do Airbnb. I want to do VRBO. I want to get a rental and start making some money. Like, what's the first thing you feel like they should do once they make that decision? Find out who you want to cater to. Um, that, that target avatar. Target avatar. Find out who you want to cater to. Make sure they're actually coming to the area. Um, after you find out who you want to cater to, find the area that those people are going to, and then make sure that area is legal to actually operate. Because that's one thing things are. That happens all the time. People go to areas you can't operate. Make sure there's no HOA on the property. Make sure there's no laws <laughs> against it. <laughs> first thing that happens is you get shut down. Trust me, I've been there. My very first one, we got shut down due to HOA. So, yeah, and find out who you want to cater to. So, basically, I'll, I'll actually start off with my very first one where we got shut down due to HOA. We mm-hmm. really weren't – we were rookies. We didn't know. We just knew that the AT&T Stadium was right there, and I'm like – People come to that stadium. And of course, we were booked out doing that. So we started with our target avatar first and it worked, but we got shut down because it was an HOA there. But yeah, having that target avatar and uh, find a target avatar that's higher paying. Um, a lot of people, what I'm getting into now is government contracts. So mm-hmm. going on to like SAM.gov, getting a government contract, you know, those those things pay out, you know, huge. So right. getting getting something like that, having that type of a, just having a target avatar of who you can serve. Cool, cool. Okay. Um, I think I have this question too, but a lot of people probably do. What's okay. your craziest story that you have to share when it comes to this uh, rental game? Because if people have heard some stories, they probably wonder, like, and what's this craziest? Craziest? Man, I have a bunch. Uh, <laughs> you I have got a whole books were? Huh? Yeah, yeah, I really do. Uh, I have one. Uh, so I don't use my profile picture. 
Um, I use just a profile picture of someone else uh, who doesn't look like me. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a light, nice young lady looking like young lady. She She's our profile picture. And we've had some oh, rather nice strange marketing. things. What? That's nice marketing. I'm sure that's a <laughs> heck of a lead generator. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes you don't want these leads. So we had <laughs> one dude, he booked with us. He didn't send us a picture of himself in a Speedo. Said oh. my new Speedo. I'm like, bro, what in the world? Bro, I've, I've had... <laughs> some crazy stories like so many crazy ones now it's just like what are you doing so we had of course had to report his profile uh that um oh i had a party breakout at one of my places in arkansas Ooh. uh they had the reason and the funny thing is i'm gonna tell you how we found out they were having a party the police actually went before we even got a hold of it and they called me you know and this right. is in jacksonville arkansas they called me and said hey uh just letting you know there's a party at your airbnb we can break it up for you if you want I was like, yeah, she was, and then the officer was cool. She was like, I yeah, figured you didn't want a party there. So uh-huh. I was like, cool, and she broke it up. And then the whole time, my niece was texting me, but I didn't see her text. And she was telling me a party was there because these people have set up cameras and went on mm-hmm. IG Live, and they having a whole party <laughs> in, the, in the place, man. And I'm like, oh, man. And then, like, they had these big old signs. They had made sign streamers. It was called, mm-hmm. like, Tasha's get effed up party in this big old sign when they first walked in. I was like, bro, what is this, man? So, yeah, that, that was one party we had. And then oh, I had a bunch of them. Uh, man, I'd had so many stories over the last five years, man. Just crazy stuff. But yeah, I, I've had those little mirror ones that right off the bat. I know I'll think of one when we end the podcast. I'm going to be like, oh, I should have said that. <laughs> Trust me, I've had some crazy stuff happen. Yeah, it'll probably play out that way. Uh, for those of y'all that are kind of concerned, like there are things you can do to mitigate uh, that happening, like getting the a ring doorbell. And uh, also uh, there's a sound monitoring system called a uh, Minute. You can uh, mm-hmm. get that installed. So if it gets too loud in there, you're automatically notified that you can take care of it. So there are precautions that you could take. So I don't think like, oh, gosh, like it's just like a random rule of fate. If it happens, a lot of times like people will see this stuff like, oh, well, that's not going to fly. But if something does happen, you know as soon as possible and then you can deal with it. Yeah. And then another thing is house rules, man. Making sure your everything's in your house rules and the charges that happen if they break <laughs> those house rules. Um, like if, if it's a, if it's Airbnb, you gotta make sure everything's in that house in those house rules. So definitely look into Airbnb, make sure your house rules are st- is set in stone as well, man. And then uh that minute play is great because minute you can actually set it up to get sent over to Slack so your VA can catch it and start taking care of it. Also, my nude is working to set up uh, to actually work directly with responders, so then they can I have. I can't wait for that. Me neither. I can, I've, I've been waiting for that. So then <laughs> they can send the responders out or the uh, security team out to go ahead and stop the party. So that's a that's a uh, great great thing is having that minute system. Right, right. So when it comes to these uh, OVA platforms, like what's your what's your favorite one? My favorite one is my own website. That is my favorite one, but. As far as, yeah, my favorite one is my own website, but uh, I, I'm gonna be 100 transparent. I'm not a fan of Airbnb. I don't. I don't really like them. Oh yeah, uh, see, I, I couldn't tell. I really couldn't. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just be honest with right. you. I'm he just hasn't said fan. anything here, but listen to his podcast. He's made it known on multiple occasions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just not a fan. Uh, I, I mean. The, your better clientele always comes in directly because they're willing to put their card up like, hey, we're out here to break nothing. Um, and then after my after that, I think would probably be Airbnb brings a lot of revenue, but I just don't like the platform and where they've gone. Uh, but Verbo, Verbo brings in an older crowd. Mm-hmm. I like that. And then it just depends on what it is. I don't really have a favorite one. I just know who's on what. And I know just with the Airbnb, it's just so much garbage filtering through there. You have to like <laughs> put strong house rules in and really target down on your target avatar. Well, I mean, let, let's go ahead and roll with the uh, direct booking. So like, uh, mm-hmm. well, what are the things you like the most about that? Because some people are, look, I, I know this myth is a myth, but some people are like, well, if Airbnb's insurance isn't, insurance isn't involved, it's not going to be covered and like blah, 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 this or that, like, uh, why do you consider direct bookings to be uh, more of the favorite? Um, direct bookings is, uh, first off, if something does break up in there, you can use things like Superhog and Proper. Proper insurance will cover it. 
and Super Hog will also run a background check on the guest and then pay out if they damage anything. So you have two layers of insurance there. If they do come in through Airbnb, you just have a third layer of insurance. Plus, if you ever file the claim with Airbnb, it's a pain in the butt anyway to get it done anyway because they're going to ask you a whole bunch of questions trying to side with the guest anyway. But direct side, man, they're better guests because they're going to put their card up. Um, you have access to them. You are you can build your brand because I'm real big on branding. When I go into like when I you walk into one of my units, everything's branded. The doormats, the coffee mugs, uh, the the coasters, all of it has our website on it. Uh, QR code if you want to uh, book again. Um, but they're just better guests, man. And then you don't have to worry about like you know if they have a complaint, they come directly to you, and you can be the hospitality person thing with airbnb you could be the hospitality person until they want to overstep their boundary and be the hospitality person for your property so direct i love direct all day and at this point with airbnb getting oversaturated and catering more to the um to the uh you know the what i would call it the um more upscale listings the a-frames the tree houses Mm -hmm. right it's a good thing to separate yourself and then kind of have your own business and your own brand because I'm not, I don't think Airbnb is going to go away, but I think that you're going to see an oversaturation of just so many people hopping into it. I think you're just going to see an oversaturation of certain types of products. And Airbnb already sees it and sees the money where the money is, which is the the unique style stays. Got you, got you. Yeah, and that's the one thing that I'm going to start working on pretty soon is uh, building up a direct booking brand. Like uh, I'm going to get a QR code. And people, I, if you have an interest in going direct. You could do this, but whether it's a business card or a QR code that's on the sign of the, of the door, mm-hmm. basically like, hey, if you uh, want to book with me again and you go direct, offer them like a 5 or 10% discount or whatever and get their mm-hmm. email. And then you're building up. You're basically taking the marketing that these platforms are doing for you and taking it on upon yourself. And that means you can run certain discounts or you can just keep in contact with them to get more direct bookings. And before you know it, you don't need these OVAs at all. That's where you want to be. That's where you want to be. Now you have a business. You know, the whole two, three years ago, the whole Airbnb business was a thing. That ain't no thing no more. You forget that. We ain't build not, we don't not build our business on another man's land. Right, right. Yeah. So when you what do you feel is needed for someone to go full time like in the rental market space nowadays? Like if they decide, you know, they've had part time success, but now they want to take it to full time, quit their job. What do you feel they need to make that leap? Uh, To make that leap, you need to be very consistent with what you do. You need to have a routine. Um, I think uh, to go full time, it's a mindset. If you don't have the mindset, you you can't go full time. Uh, You need to have a mindset. You need to you need to understand finances and how you how you get paid from your business. You need to be getting paid from your business. And I mean, on a W-2. So you need to be Read the book that I recommend for everyone before they leave their nine to five is to read profit first. That book right there will change your whole business aspect. Now you know how to pay your taxes, you know, how to uh, how to pay yourself um, and then, you know, learn how to pay yourself on a W-2 and make sure that salary covers what you're you know, that salary can co- needs to cover what you're currently making. Right. So if you right. make 80,000 a year, you need to boost your business up to where you can make like let's say you take 10% salary from your company you just take 10% you need to be making $800,000 a year to make that you know what i mean so yeah. you bid your company needs to bring in 800,000 and you take your 10% uh so it's just a matter of mindset have a routine know that you're the type of person that can get up and go get it you know what i mean there's going to be yeah. times when the business is slow so do you know how to turn your do you know how to go from passive income and turn on your active income you know certain things like that come up so it's just a mindset. You got to have the mindset. Of, you got to have the three G's: goals, grit, and a goal. Was what is it about three G's? I always say, and you need to have goals, grit, and gratitude. So you got to be thankful for what you have because there's gonna be times where you want more, but you got to be stop and be thankful for what you already have with gratitude. Mm-hmm. And then your goal goals. You know, have your goals. You already know. I keep my goals behind me. And you got to have that grit to go get it. Nice. Three G's. I like that. And the uh, book you mentioned, we'll be sure to include a link to that in the uh, show notes. And speaking of uh, what we touched. Yeah. Speaking on full time, uh, what caused you to go uh, full time? Because I know for a while 
uh, at this point, you're full time into the business, right? And uh, you had left your nine to five a few months ago, right? Yeah, I uh, left my nine to five last November, man. And it's crazy. The months flew by. Uh, November, actually, tomorrow <laughs> will be the, I left November 21st, I believe was my last day or November 19th. But uh, yeah, man, I was just working full time. I was, a, I'm an engineer by trade and I've been doing engineer work for the last, what, since 2012. So about 10 years. Um, and then, uh, you know, I had, uh, I caught pneumonia and uh, I caught pneumonia from Legionnaires and I oh. went to the hospital and while I was in the hospital, it was in the middle of COVID. So then my wife couldn't be there. My son couldn't be there. Oh, and then gosh. my wife was seven months pregnant. So, well, eight months pregnant, no, seven months pregnant. So that happened in October. So she was like seven months pregnant. And, uh, I was decided then I was like, man, if I was to ever, if this would be the, if I was just truly sick or whatever, right. And I couldn't leave, like, would I be satisfied with where I've been in my life? And I decided I wouldn't be. So I decided, Hey, when I get out of here, I'm going to, after I get out, I'm going to just go full time in my business. So then I can always, no matter what, I'll have time with my family. You know, I was like, I'll just go ahead and go through the grind, go through the through the ups and downs. And I, all that does is just make you a stronger person. Right. When you choose uncom- yeah. when you choose to be de- uncomfortable, it just makes you a stronger person. So I decided to go ahead then. And then I put my when I got out, I used all my vacation time. And uh, <laughs> then I came back and I put my two weeks notice in. And I remember my supervisor, he was like, yeah, we figured you were leaving. So I was <laughs> All the signs uh, were there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so he's like, we figured you were leaving. So and I just told him, I was like, man, I, I just got to give my time to my family, man. And I got to we'll be willing to work with my family work. And then so after I left, my le- wife left her job in March. And so we've been both full time in our businesses, man. And it, it's been the greatest thing ever. It's been you have your ups and downs, but you see how stronger y'all are together, working together how your mindset starting to shift, you know, you become mentally strong, but that all comes with having that routine, man. Cause like I get up at five in the morning, I read my 10 pages for the day. I go to the gym. Once I come back home, shower up, make me a shake, a little healthy shake, get to work, you know? And then I make sure that I, I'm not overworking myself. Like a lot of people are like, man, I quit my nine to five so I can work 40, 80 hours a week. I don't believe in that mentality. Forget that, man. Just right, do your right. three tasks, your high-end tasks for the day. I do three tasks a day. Knock out my three tasks. Then after that, go spend time with my family, man. I don't want to be over grinding. Like I think we have this um we have an what is it? An unhealthy relationship with the grind instead of, hey man, let's build up some passive income so we don't have to grind ourselves into the ground. I forgot the brother who said it on the Breakfast Club. He said, Man, we we want to grind ourselves in the ground. He said, if you ever look at an old married couple, the woman walking around just fine, the man limping around because he's been grinding all his life. He goes, man, I don't want that. He goes, right. I grind hard, but I rest even harder. I'm like, that's the truth right there, man. That's how I want my life to be. That's wealth to me, man. Health, being healthy, financial freedom, all that in one where you can, you don't have to go to work. That's wealth to me. Oh, uh, That's uh, what I call the hustler's origin story. You have a powerful one. Mm. It's yeah. like, uh, for me, it's not nearly as epic, but uh, when I used to work at Amazon when I was a PA, I just uh, mm-hmm. got this vibe that I wasn't living up to my full potential. And at the time, I actually had the skill sets of, uh, originally, I got my sales skills from network marketing. I had built up like a huge downline, but um, I didn't like the fact that I only got like this portion of what I was selling. So mm-hmm. then I went into freelancing, but I just got the feeling that I wasn't living up to my full potential. It was the worst feeling on the planet. So eventually I put in uh, my two two weeks notice because I had these skills, but I didn't have the confidence of, well, can I really do this full time by myself? Mm-hmm. But the only way that's going to come is if I let the cushion go. So I okay. put in my two weeks and uh, it was the best decision I ever made in my life. But I, I, I get what you mean when you say, it's a balance between the grind and passive income because like there's a lot of talk about toxic hustle culture Mm. and i say the it's all about working smart not necessarily working hard or just doing both like be the laziest hard worker you can be that's what i say i love that man go into that you said be the laziest hard worker you can be uh go use an example of that i love that (laughs) uh a good example is Actually, uh, one the YouTube channel. So everyone knows I have uh, two monetized YouTube channels, Financial Anatomy and the App Lifestyle. Mm-hmm. They took a long time to build up, but now they have revenue coming in, and I don't have to do anything. 
If I make a video, the money just keeps stacking. But I've literally gone like two months without uploading, and the money just stayed the same. I love that. It's the fruits of the labor. It's the other side of the equation mm-hmm. from the grind. If you're just grinding, 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 but you're not building something passive that's going to start flowing in, well, of course you're going to burn out. And then, like, when I get old, I want to be able to, like, play football, like, with my grandkids and, like, be able to walk upstairs without damn near having a heart attack. I can't do that <laughs> if I grinded myself into the ground. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I love that, man. I love it. So I, I, I don't want to turn this into an interview about you, but you said you do network marketing. Uh, I uh, I did. Like, that's how I got my sales skills. Mm-hmm. But um, like I said, I wanted to, well, I always end the podcast with asking my guests, do they want to ask a question to me? So mm-hmm. I guess this is your question. We'll go ahead yeah. and go into it. Uh, yeah. So when you look at a lot of people focus on like how much money you're making, I'll focus on how much money was made and what was my share. <laughs> so if I'm getting like five to 10 percent of all that, like, no, that ain't going to fly. So that's when I looked into freelancing and uh, by trade, I became a video editor and a website designer. Then I started seeing, hey, I could charge like, you know, three hundred, five hundred dollars to design a website and all that is mine. And as far as video editing goes, well, I can do these big projects where I can make like a thousand to three thousand dollars per month and get these long term contracts. And it's all mine. This percentage thing, like, man, <laughs> and I already had the sales skills. So this was a no brainer. Like, what am I still doing this shit for? Let's go yeah. ahead and go into the freelancing. Yeah, I love that because uh, we do, me, me and my wife, we do network marketing a little bit. So we do network marketing on, and real estate. So, you know, we uh, we have our own health and fitness uh, business and we do have the real estate business. And yeah, and what, what I do is to balance them out. Like a downline can quit on you, right? Right, right. So a rental property won't quit on you. So you always have that. You have to have that healthy balance. So this rental property ain't going to quit because you ain't about to quit because we can get we got you insured, everything else. And then that downline can, but you got to keep growing it. So, yeah, I understand. That's why I was asking you do network marketing. Yeah. So we do a little bit of that as well, man. That's real cool. Yeah. Um, at the time I did uh, the company was Total Life Changes, a TLC. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, honestly, they had a generous compensation plan, but, um, you know, it just wasn't enough for me. I, I already described like why it wasn't. But yeah, I, I, still, I still highly recommend it for people, uh, network marketing in general, for people that uh, need sales skills, but they may be a little too introverted. Mm, and it, I it, like that. Yeah. And um, if you build the downline up, I still say it's a good way of making money. Just make sure you're following the blueprint we just laid out. Yeah. Put some it of that money you. into something passive. Yeah. And it helps you. It also helps you your leadership development skills. That's what I love about it as well. And you're going to meet a lot of awesome people because people who tend to be successful in network marketing, uh, they get in the habit of either facing their fears or they just get into a lot of habits to carry over nicely into the business world. And you're around these people like at conventions and stuff. So if you network on purpose, man, your network is going to expand a lot. So it's a great place to make friends. I know one thing I always say about Elijah, man, I don't know if the people who don't know Elijah you go to any networking event about real estate, anything, Elijah is going to be there, man. I, I swear, I walked into, me and my wife, we walked into a, uh, we walked into this big multifamily, these big multifamily millionaires are up in there. And me and my wife walked in, we're kind of intimidated. And I'm like, dang, okay, man, they do all this multifamily, we in the single family space. Lo and behold, Elijah's just sitting over there networking, networking and figuring it all out. He's just like us. I'm like, I love it, man. So I love that it, it, network marketing does help you become a better leader and it helps you get out of your shell. And I needed that for real estate because I've door knocked people, cold call people, and you got to really get out of your shell, man. Oh, yeah. I would say uh, in a freelance game, I've never used Fiverr Upwork. I don't like mm-hmm. the fact that they'll give you the boot off the platform if you try and take that relationship and go direct. So I never got involved with them. I got all my clients from prospecting, meeting them at events, uh, going to the business uh, chamber of commerce, giving my 30 to 60 second pitch. I, I got it on the streets. So all that came from network marketing. So Bro, you you be perfect. Once you hop into this short term rental game full time, you perfect, man, because you ain't afraid to go. <laughs> hey, you need housing. We got you. That's all you need. See, now that's what I'm saying. I love that you did that because that's basically what the Airbnb game is. It's Fiverr and all they can kick you off the platform. You know, I love that you did that, man. That's what's up, man. That's what's up. 
Yeah. So I'll go ahead and hit you with our last question, which is uh, a lot of people want to know what share BNB is. And I know you have uh, some uh, invested interest in it. So how about you hit us with what that is and uh, how I can help the audience? Okay. So share BNB is actually the company me and my wife started. Um, that's actually our company, our brand. So if you actually go to sharebnb.com, you can book our properties directly. Um, those are just our 50, we sell it, it should be a total of 15 up there, hopefully by the end of next month. Those are our 15 properties, 10 of them we arbitrage, no, 11 we arbitrage and four that we own. And then we also have, Sharebnb also hosts, uh, hosts a bunch of timeshares that we rent out, and those are strictly on Airbnb. That's about 400 plus properties over there that we host, and that's just from our timeshare. Um, we just basically take a cut of that every month. But uh, Sharebnb is our company. Uh, it's all for about catering to families, business travelers, traveling professionals. And that's just our company where you can book with us directly. Mm. So yeah. you built a company based around your target avatar. Yes, sir. Oh, man, that's inspiring. It's badass. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for sure, man. For sure. I had to. Had to. <laughs> All right, Micah. So for people who want to get more of you, like uh, where can they uh, get in contact with you? Where can they find you? You know, you can tell us a little bit about your podcast, too. OK, um, well, you can find me on Instagram at Micah Artist and my IG is at Live Let Thrive um, and our share BNB page at Share Bed and Breakfast. Um, but so, yeah, you can find me there. Instagram. Um, I'm live on Clubhouse every Wednesday, 730. Me, my podcast partner, our other two partners. Um, and then our podcast, Live, Let, Thrive. It's all about short term rentals, real estate. It drops every Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon. A new episode drops. So y'all can check that out. We are the we are I think we're right behind Jasper, who's our good friend uh, as the second longest running short term rental podcast. We've been doing it for five years, man. And we we didn't think we'd grow this big. We didn't got over 200 episodes. So it's been real exciting. So recording now, it's just so much fun because it's like, dang, we got a lot of people listening to us. So, yeah, that's where you can find me. Cool, cool. All right, everyone. We're going to go ahead and conclude this episode of, of the Side Hustler Society podcast. If y'all found value in this episode and uh, you're watching on YouTube, give this video a thumbs up for the algorithm. Very much appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new. And if you're listening to us on Apple, if you could uh, drop a review about the value of the podcast, it would greatly help us out. And if you have a topic, a side hustle or a hustle you want to see represented on the show, you know, just uh, reach out to me and we can make that happen. So with that being said, everyone, we'll catch you all in the next one. This episode may be over, but your hustling journey has just started. Visit the SideHustleSociety.com to access all links and resources mentioned in the show that will help you on your hustler's journey.